As I get started, I thought I'd just open up with a couple of comments, quick comments about SI2 for those of you who may not uh, know about us. SI2 is an R&D joint venture. We develop uh, standard interfaces for uh, and interoperability solutions for IC design tools. Uh, many of you will know us for open access, which is an industry standard database that is used by many of the companies here. Uh, we also uh, support uh, compact SPICE model development. And uh, we have uh, an, a development initiative called Open Standards, where we develop uh, new technologies and standards for uh, kit package co-design, which we'll talk about here today. But along with that, low power design, process design kits, design for manufacturability, and uh, silicon photonics. Our members include foundries, EDA companies, um, design houses, and here you see uh, uh, the logos of, uh, of our member companies, we have uh, well over uh, 60 of them, uh, so we're very broad-based. So to start, uh, I want to uh, give a little test to all of you on famous boundaries to see which of these boundaries you might recognize. Does anyone recognize that boundary? It's a Berlin Wall. Next one? Anybody? Especially here in Austin. Yes, that's the Rio Grande River. It's the uh, mouth of the Santa Elena Canyon. It's a border between uh, Texas and Mexico. And uh, lower left? You got it. Korean DMZ. And finally, Silicon Package. So we see boundaries everywhere. So um, in designing across boundaries, which is really what the topic of this panel session is about, there's a, uh, at least from my perspective, there's a couple of uh, different mainline approaches. The first we call segregated, which is you clearly maintain the lines of demarcation between silicon design and package design. Uh, at the other extreme is an integrated approach where you blur the lines of demarcation as much as possible. For the segregated approach, basically what a designer or a design team will do is design in each domain, kind of uh, in, in the tool specific from that domain, without paying much attention to the other domain. So if you're a silicon designer, you don't think much about the package. If you're a package designer, you don't think much about the silicon. But there's issues with that. You have to pass data between tools. And how do you deal with this one issue here, cross-domain checks and interactions? On the other hand, with an integrated approach where you're going to, as, we, as they say, blur the lines of demarcation, um, you need design tools that are going to support multi-domain features. But that often raises the question of what's the host domain? Is it the silicon world? If so, th those tools have to be expanded to uh, deal with uh, package and board specific issues. Uh, use of curves or gridless design is, is one example of that. If the packaging world is the host domain, um, generally the package folks aren't used to quite dealing with the huge databases that the, the silicon folks deal with. And then there's also the question if the silicon designers will accept those kind of tools. But at any rate, I'm not here to answer that. I'm here to pose some of the questions. And we have a uh, panel of uh, distinguished developers that can speak to that. We have uh, Humer Mondavia from Zukin, Brandon Wang from Cadence, and uh, Teresa McLaurin from ARM. So uh, I'm not uh, checking my email. Um, what I'm doing here is I have the bios on my phone, so I want to. Uh, Check that to make sure I get uh, folks' uh, bios correct. So we'll start with Humer. Humer Mandavia is the chief strategy is in the chief strategy office at Zukin and responsible for the Sozo Center in Silicon Valley, Zukin's R&D division in the U.S. His role includes working with industry-leading customers to drive the latest innovation in electronic design to market for PCB, advanced packaging design and system level co-design. 
A member of the Zookin team since 2004, his experience includes working as an FAE with the CR5000 solution, product marketing, and director of engineering. Professional experience includes working as a hardware design engineer in the telecommunications industry, designing ATM and Sonnet applications. Humer completed his Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering and MBA from the University of Texas at Dallas. Humer. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, today I want to talk about how we want to kind of shift that uh, methodology from spreadsheets to going into EDA you know, through the caveat uh, uh, of uh, chip package board co-design. And uh, I think, uh, if, uh, if you can go ahead into the next slide, I think uh, to kind of follow up with what Jerry was saying, we really have, from a simplistic point of view, three domains that we all work in, right? We have the chip domain, we have the package domain, and we have the PCB domain, and we're also tackling issues such as TSVs, uh, 3DICs, uh, and the packaging side, you know, do you want to go package on package, you know, SIP technology, uh, uh, and also on the F uh, PCB, you have embedded components and high speed, but I think a lot of these other topics kind of propagate uh, in each domain in its own way, but when we start looking at the system holistically, the issue that we're running into is that uh, you know, design teams are running into problems, and this is where the spreadsheets come in, is that, you know, engineers are using different net names, you know, from a chip versus a package versus a board. You know, we want to start looking at ball development. We're still using spreadsheets, but, you know, for simple grid arrays, they're okay, but when you start having different pitches on the, uh, on the ball grid, spreadsheets get a little challenging, right? And you got to color code things, you got to eyeball stuff, and, uh, and you also have to look at, you know, the, from the analysis point of view, the DFM point of view. Is this going to be, you know, can, is it tape out ready? Is it tape out quality? And also the IO optimization and bump planning, right? A lot of times we, you know, as Jerry was also alluding to, one of the key boundaries is around uh, chip package, right? So we think about how to optimize the ball uh, against the PCB, but also make sure that you're considering the routability, both from electrical and physical standpoint, uh, you know, on the package with relative to the die bumps on a chip. So. A lot of issues, right? But people still work in their boxes. And I think one of the key th you know, uh, methodology changes that we're looking at is if we can go with a more system level uh, holistic approach for co-design, we can help shift that gear from having a more intelligent approach and also then uh, evolving away from spreadsheets. So, so I think one three key areas that when we talk about spreadsheets is, is you know, when we're talking about ball development, bump planning, and, and net nate management, and you're talking about constraints. These are still one of those key items that are done in spreadsheets. And what we want to do is see, okay, how do we get away from spreadsheet and also a lot of other non-engineering tools or methods that are used in the process, which, you know, as we know, is you know, a lot of reasons why you know, errors are made throughout uh, the design process as a whole. So, so those are some of the challenges that we're seeing today in the market. Um, and, and also, you know, the thing that we also think about is that uh, there's, there's the domains itself and there's going to be the flows. And, you know, one of the flows is, you know, just a simplistic point of view is leading from pathfinding down to the implementation. You have design teams in a lot of our uh, companies that are trying to identify, oh, do I use an interposer? Do I stack the dies? Do I introduce, uh, you know, uh, 3D uh, or TSVs? And, you know, you're doing all that work in that space, but then how does that translate to a production design? You're, you're working in completely different tools, data's not being exchanged or reused. So a lot of rework's being done, again, that's very error prone. So we gotta figure out how to bridge that gap. Uh, also, uh, you know, the other thing I'm seeing in the market space is that with the automotive applications and the IoT and other areas, uh, the, you know, that, what does that even mean from an you know, electronic design point of view? That thing's, there's more high-speed interfaces, more RF stuff. So a lot of these companies are all gearing up how to, uh, you know, very quickly create RF modules. So that means, you know, adding more components, more passives to the package, doing more analysis with the CAE tool, especially around the RF side. Uh, so module design's a key area that's kind of driving this whole paradigm shift. Um, also, when we think about how to collaborate across multiple domains. Uh, one of the, we can take a consideration is IO optimization. So, you know, with co-design, what we really need to do is look at how can we optimize the IOs concurrently with all the domains? You know, you know like we say chip package board, but you may have interposers, you may have other domains or objects or across the fabrics, fabrics you want to care about, but you have to consider it both from a physical and electrical point of view. So the simulation has to be part of it. So where we see some of the challenges right now is that a lot of different companies out there have their own processes. Even within companies themselves, they have 
different teams doing all sorts of other different flows. Some are more top down, some are more product level, coming back up. Uh, so you know, every team is looking at which way to get that product out faster. So we're seeing that kind of issue take place. Uh, and this is another reason why we're using all these tool, uh, you know, you know, manual methods like spreadsheets because the CAD tools aren't you know, supporting the various flows that are out there. And also the integration with the CAE side. I, I think this is a, a, an issue that may take some time in the industry to resolve uh, because you, you do have you know, the EDA tools that can do a lot of stuff from a pure you know, detailed point of view. Uh, but then there are some new companies that are developing tools for pathfinding, and they're great tools. But you know, there's no linkage to the production side. There's no reuse of information. There's no data exchange. So, and then also we kind of see the conundrum where the accuracies are always being questioned. So, you know, the company down there, friends over at Ansys with HFSS, for example, just to kind of give an example. You know, everything's being benchmarked because accuracy is always up for question. People don't want to take a chance on any deltas. Even though a lot of times we've proven out that those deltas are negligible, a lot of these companies will tell you that. We've been part of those exercises, but uh, accuracy is key. So how do you maintain that accuracy with nth degree of detail and managing, you know, quick, fast simulation? Because a lot of times when you're trying to do this multi-level, uh, system-level analysis, the simulation time can take up to weeks to even get to an answer. So this is some industry problems that we're seeing today. And also, the other problem that I find is that, you know, from the EDA point of view, we need to invest more in the space, right? A lot of the systems that are out there that are used, uh, on, especially on the package board side, those tools are over 35 years old, right? And they're more 2D centric. And if we're looking at embedding components on an RF module or stacking dies, uh, looking at TSVs, or, you know, do you want to go with a, a heterogeneous technologies on an interposer? you need to have a 3D environment that's considering all domains at one, one area. So we got to look at how do we solve 3D problems in a, probably in a more 3D system level environment. So one of the things that we're trying to do from the EDA side is to enable a true chip package board co-design environment. Uh, the secret sauce behind it is you know, leveraging the open access from SI2 to be able to uh, bring in you know, chip level or chip centric information and combine that with what we're doing on the package board. As you know, I think Jerry was also alluding to that those domains are completely different. Resolutions are different, databases are different. So how do we manage package or board level details in the chip side and vice versa, right? So you want to be able to bring a system that's hierarchical, that's also connected very closely with the analysis, the mechanical. I think mechanical is also a very key component. A lot of companies, when they're thinking about IoT or any other consumer products, they want to consider the form factor. Right, if you can take you know, a whole product line of chips and narrow it down where you only have several to manage for, to support all different uh, form factors and application, that's less overhead, less, less cost from a uh, design point of view. So, uh, and then DFM aspect, as we know, that's also very uh, crucial in, the, let's say, even DFT as well. So having a hierarchical structure that can easily uh, create these systems, I think it's key, that allows you to give you uh, visibility on the full system interconnect is important. And I think other enabler, enablers that we have to start thinking about if we really want to get away from spreadsheets is that we have to look at how to go from a ch you know, chip domain or a package domain or a board domain and go to a more of a product centric or system level domain. I think that's going to be a key enabler for a lot of companies to get away from the, you know, more manual approaches. Uh, also, I, like I was mentioned before, mechanical's critical. And a lot of times we're using you know, uh, flat 2D files, again, even here to uh, you know, try to understand what some of the mechanical constraints are. And I think if we take more of a, uh, a 3D approach to it, to the system, because it is a 3D problem, it's a 3D issue, we want to be able to also understand that if we're stacking things, right, is it going to create conflict with the, with the product I'm looking to impl implement it in, right? So that's a, that's a key question that we have to uh, uh, solve, and uh, we're looking to do that. So, and also, we want to be able to create the assemblies. A lot of times when I talk to customers, they're, they're doing it maybe in mechanical, but they're just kind of taking you know, cuboids of the different shapes to make the mechanical, uh, or in the mechanical tools, or you're getting into the CAE tools when you're actually seeing the whole system. And I think if we want to do co-design, I think it's important that we take uh, any degree of uh, detail or all the domains and implement it very quickly into one environment. And I'll share some information about that in just a moment. Also, as I kind of highlighted in the uh, issue slide, where you have you know net name management and constraints, and uh, you know you know from a ball development point of view, all those details, 
need an easy, simple management environment so you can optimize the IOs, you can you know, look at how to best improve the RDL routing on a chip, uh, how else to go ahead and manage some of those constraints. And again, accommodate for all the different flows. Like I said, you have some top-down flows, you have some more packet-centric flows we're seeing companies evolve to. So the flows are different, so you need you know, some flexibility from that standpoint. And also, uh, as I kind of mentioned before, we're trying to leverage uh, the open access environment. And what that's allowing us to do today with the companies that we're working with is that you're not taking some abstract of the chip when you're co-designing the package and board. You're working with the real chip data. So if you make any changes to the RDL routing or the die bumps, you can then exchange that information natively back into the chip layout tools for any kind of final testing and verification and go to tape out. Uh, and then you want to be able to have access to you know, feasibility and tape out quality routing at that point as well in those environments. So being able to work in that concurrent database environment is, is crucial to this co-design. And also making sure that in this co-design environment, you want the ability to have all your package PCB level rules along with your chip level rules. Again, this is, there are completely different domains, com completely different resolutions. And if we can bring those together and have some of the functionalities that, you know, from a manufacturing point of view, if you do have all the proper rules of handling a TSV intelligently, not just as a dumb via shape, but actually the true TSV cell or cells, you want to be able to handle that uh, in the system and manage that data accurately. Uh, and th but this also allows you to, you know, kind of help, uh, you know, go from, you know, pathfinding or the, uh, the exploratory phase down to the production phase as well. Uh, because again, this allows you to go to any nth degree of detail because everybody's doing it differently. So you want that flexibility. And also data exchange. So I think where we're seeing a lot of the usage of spreadsheets in the market is that you know, design teams are working with themselves trying to ex exchange information by spreadsheets, by emails or PowerPoints. But also, okay, I've made something, now I gotta go validate it and I wanna go simulate it. So I'm using you know, other text files or spreadsheets or other mechanisms to do so. So one of the initiatives we've partaken into is that uh, there's a format, uh, system level format called LPB. So in the LPB format, we're looking at an intelligent XML-based standard uh, that's driven through IEEE and uh, JADA. Uh, and uh, you know, as we look at uh, our efforts with SI2, we'll see how we can leverage uh, this kind of approach where you have one system level, system level data format where you have the uh, geometries, you have the net list, the project information, the design rules, all the details that are necessary that are, should be controllable so that when you want to do system level data exchange, it's easy. Think about it, right? We, we put a chip, we have a chip, we have a package, we have a board. Now I want to simulate it. How are we doing that today? We open up the CAE tool, we say, okay, let's get GDS2 data, let's go bring that in, okay? Then we can you know, output some file for packaging and we'll go and bring that data in and we'll go and bring in you know, PCB and oh, now I have to figure out how this thing is all gonna connect. This is where we're wasting a lot of time, right? So this is where we're trying to get, uh, get to is where we can uh, not only do the data exchange and manage any ECOs in the process. So you know, we're, we're already leveraging these kinds of standards to help get away from the spreadsheets. And, and just kind of an example from a flow perspective, you know, how are we controlling ECO? So we can do this intelligently now, where you know, let's take for example, you have uh, a design, a system design with the multiple domains. Uh, you know, it could be a chip package board, for example, and you you want to easily put them together, and you want to be able to maybe extract out what that system level netlist looks like. But now changes happen, right? We know that oh you know, my, I did this analysis, this got to get swapped, right? Power delivery is poor, got to make a change. So change happens. So you want to be able to make that change easily, be able to compare, and somebody has to go off and sign off, right? When somebody signs off on these things. And then you want to synchronize. You want to make sure that if you did make a change uh, on the package, that that gets reflected on the chip intelligently in real time. You want to be able to do that. And then be able to then archive what that system level netlist looks like so you can go and compare it for a third iteration if necessary. Hopefully with this co-design, you're not getting into too many iterations and, and handoffs in the process. So this is just an example of just ECO management that we can now, from an EDA point of view, do from a system level and co-design without having to go into you know, manual processes. And also when I talked about you know, trying to bridge you know, you know, the feasibility or the exploratory work or pathfinding into the actual production design, Again, now with, with co-design and being able to go to a more intelligent approach, you can start doing your you know, die shrinking and die size analysis and IO counts and start planning out what type of package you want to use, what are going to be some of the constraints of the board or boards you may want to use. You know, if you think about some of the products that are being designed today, 
seven, eight years ago, this was one board. Now there's like eight, nine uh, boards and flex boards in this, right? So to manage the connectivity with all the high-speed interfaces is very challenging. So you want to be able to do your proper bump planning and ball development and have that then reuse automatically, uh, instantaneously, if anything, into the actual production design to really helping drive that uh, process change from spreadsheets. So uh, just to kind of wrap it up on my part, uh, I just kind of wanted to share you know, just how the whole process looks like just from a snap uh, point of view. Um, so if you can go ahead and hit the play button on that. Yeah, we can do it that way. So you see here, you, there's, a, there's all these different uh, domains. You have PCBs, you have packages, you have interposers, you have stack dies with, uh, you know, uh, TSVs. These are separate designs traditionally, right? So what we want to do is uh, uh, we want to be able to bring these together very easily. So what we have enabled is like a, what we call a multi-domain constraint manager. This allows you to, through a wizard to say, okay, here's the relationship. You know, the board's going to be the parent. You're going to have the package. Here's the interposer. Here's the stack dies. And again, as I mentioned before, the net names on the chip is different from the package versus the board. Let's create a system level electrical net that we can easily assemble and navigate throughout the process. So there's wizards in place that allow you to easily, instantaneously, within minutes, create a full system assembly. And this could be, you know, full of a production flow or even, you know, augmented to your current process. And here's an example of a PCB where you have two packages, and on the top left you have a, a tree that shows the hierarchy. And again, I want to go and enable the uh, the package with wire bonds. There's an interposer, and then you'll see three stacked dies with TSVs just to see the full assembly, and you can bring in the enclosure, now you got the full system, you got the full product. That's just great from a viewing standpoint, but now when we talk about making changes, you know, you can have concurrent designing take place, you know, between the package and board designer and the chip, uh, and start optimizing the IOs in real time across those domains, make decisions uh, fast without iterations and handoffs, and get to, get to tape out faster. So, yeah, again, this is just one example of it, and you know, if you have any other questions, uh, you know, I'll be more than happy to answer it afterwards. But this is just kind of just showing an example of how we're changing, you know, shifting that paradigm from those spreadsheets, you know, you're going to a more intelligent EDA approach. So. Thank you, Humer. Next up is Teresa McLaurin from ARM. Teresa McLaurin is a fellow and the Design for Test Technical Lead and Manager at ARM in Austin, Texas. With over 25 years in industry, she has worked at Motorola and Western Digital in test engineering, product engineering management, and DFT. She is a senior member of IEEE, serving on the IEEE P1838 3D IC test working group, and was also a member of the IEEE 1500 standardization group. Teresa? All right, so I'm going to depart a little bit and talk about test, which doesn't, it does go in spreadsheets, but it's had to do spreadsheets even for 2D, so. Um, so first I just want to talk a little bit about, you know, we started out, we couldn't fit all these different chips on a board. We were getting smaller, smaller um, devices, and so we started doing MCMs and, and SIPs, same thing. And where you want, you, you wanted also to have different technologies for different types of IP, and you were able to put them all on, and that was all fine. We, we, we plopped them on there, and then we tested the whole thing. And generally, we didn't worry about whether this guy, these were known good die, but we didn't worry about checking whether this die still worked after we put them on uh, before we added these other known good die. And we just put them all there, and we tested them. Uh, then going into the 3D realm, we started doing, oh, there's some package on package. There's the, this uh, stack die, which to me, I was always amazed this ever worked. And... Um, <laughs> No, but it does. And then there's also the package in package type of thing. Uh, but when we talk about 3D now, we talk about something a little bit different. Uh, so, yeah, shoot, the animation's gone. All right, so there's no animation. But so if you look here, uh, unfortunately, there's no animation. So if, if you just look down here at these bottom two die, then you've got the interposer plus the bottom two die, and that's what we call 2.5D. So instead of having a SIP or an MCM, now we're now connecting it through a silicon interposer, right? That makes things a lot faster. You now have a smaller footprint because you just have to put the die on, and it's really nice, and, and this is working for some people. Um, and then we went from there going into, we want to do 3D, 3D IC. 
and where you've got these dyes stacked. And you have to think about other things that we haven't had to address in the past, which I'll, I'll talk about in a minute, uh, including things like, if I've got a memory sitting up here, where's my memory bus controller? Because I've got to test it. Do I, is it down here in this die? Do I have to talk to this die to make sure that I can test my memory up on top? So this is a, you've got new things to think about uh, and, and who does what inside this stack. And lastly, someone's coined this as 5.5D, where you've got a 2.5D, but then you stack on top of it. But I don't think that's happening anywhere. All right, so why 3D? Uh, so somewhat like the same for MCM and SIP, you need different circuits require different technology, so you want to be able to separate out these die. And uh, now you also want a smaller footprint. So you've got, you see that 3D IC, you saw those, those stacked die, you were getting a smaller footprint, you could have different technologies, but you also want lower power energy. So t what TSVs allow you to do is allow you to have less resistance and you can go up faster through the die, uh, and it's lower power. But there are other consider considerations as well, is that, well, now everybody's sharing the same VDD uh, TSVs going through. Uh, will it be reduced cost? Probably eventually, uh, never initially. And so you can think about it as, uh, this is Taipei 101, and you can think about it as this building. Somehow I need to go for test. I need to be able to go up to this floor or to this floor, and I need to get off and do something, and then I need to be able, back to, be able to bring the information back down to the bottom floor. And so it's, if, this, if all these floors were spread out, it would be like a board. Um, and so it's, 3D IC in the test world is sort of like a, a combination or a, somewhere between board, you have to consider board test as well as a chip test. And so there's a, a few different considerations. And so of course you still have pre-bond die testing. So you have a wafer probe, and the thing is, this die in the middle, he doesn't have anything to attach to. He doesn't need pads for, for the package. So he may have no, no probe pads at all, nothing to probe. So you might actually have to add test-only probe pads. Or you may figure out a different way. I've read some papers that people are thinking about different ways to test uh, for these middle-type die. Uh, and what about the TSVs? So you've got TSVs on these die. Uh, they're very small. I've read that you know some people are trying to devise these really teeny tiny probe tips that allow them to test the TSVs. Is that worth it? Plus, every time you touch down the TSV, you're damaging it. And so, you know, what do you do about the TSV? How do you test them? And do you do it before or after thinning? These guys, before you, to get to the TSVs, you actually have to thin the dye, and you have to thin it really thin. And you could damage it. Do you test before you thin or after you thin? I mean, what, what do you do? Then there's post-bond testing, and that's after you've got everything all stacked, um, and you have to make sure that each of these die can be accessed. So you don't have any pin access to this die up here or to this die up here. How do you get there? And uh, so, you know, you want to do it with minimal amount of pins that you can get, so will Elbus become really popular for 3D IC? Uh, and you have to think about testing the, the TSVs in between the die. How am I going to do that? And the mid-bond testing. Now, this is something that's new for, that people have talked about for 3D IC. So I've got this die I've put down here. And now I want to add the second die, this known good die. And these are expensive dies. So I put it on. Do I want to test it before I add the third die? Right? And this is called mid-bond testing uh, currently. So that's another consideration for test. So for 3D IC, there's all kinds of challenges, right? You've got this alignment of the TSVs, alignment of the die. You got to think about the process of, you know, will my TSVs connect up to, to uh, whatever uh, materials, different materials? And actually, they're making good progress in that area. Reliability, what happens if I start to get a little shift in my package? Am I, is my TSV going to crack? Is, is everything going to be OK still? And of course, cost initially. But there's even bigger challenges in those, and that is that now, you know, think about the mid-bomb testing example. It used to be, you know, it could be that when we create the wafer, you have the fab and it's creating the wafer, and then you go off and you say, okay, good, I'm going to test it. Now I'm going out and send it off to the assembly house to be packaged. And so it's off, it's sent to the assembly house, and then it's sent somewhere else to be tested. Well, now we want to start combining those things because we want to test as we're packaging. Right? That's, and people just aren't set up to do that kind of thing yet. And in addition, we don't have the tools and we, we've, uh, it was talked about a little bit already that, you know, so I'm now stacking one die on top of another. 
how do I know when I'm testing, if I want to test both these diet at the same time, am I heating it up so bad that now I'm going to break something or, or it's just not going to work? And we don't have tools to tell us that. We don't have tools to tell us that uh, for not just for tests, but for actual functional running. We, nothing is really out there that does that. So our whole supply chain starts to change. Okay, so for, the, um, for 3DIC, there is a, an IEEE standards group that's starting to address some of these things. And the first thing we said is, well, we need that elevator. We need that elevator that's going to take us up and back down. And so what we've decided is that, uh, that we were going to add a tap controller to each one. Now, this tap controller uh, might be, uh, you know, a tap controller that can be reused for 11.49.1, but every single die has to have a tap controller. And then this allows us then to go in and say, OK, oop, I want to get off on this die, and I want to do a little bit of testing. And then it's going, no, I don't. I want to pass this die up. I'm going to bypass him, and I want to go do a little testing. And this tap controller allows us then to give those separate instructions to do that, such as uh, uh, in test, X test for, for 1838. And for instance, an X test uh, instruction for 1838 wouldn't be the same as an X test instruction for 11.49.1. It would be a separate instruction. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. So we have this, this control this, that we're using this tap controller to do. And the second piece is, well, just like in 2D world when you're talking about cores, you, we like to wrap it. We like to isolate it. So that way we can test it. And we can test it in parallel with other things. Or we don't have to worry about what's outside of the core to test it. We do the same thing here with this die wrapper register where there is a register on every single die terminal, and it could be a shared register, right? It could be a functional register that's already there, but it's on every single terminal, terminal and that allows us then to, to isolate this die and go in through here and say, okay, I want to use this single input, and I want to go in and test this die. And, or I want to use this single input, and I want to turn on this guy, and I want to turn on this guy, and I want to do this testing of this interconnect, right? This is what this allows you to do. Uh, what these die wrapper registers allow you to do. It allows you to isolate and it allows you to test in between the die with only using the die wrapper register. So if somebody doesn't want to share their die with, with this guy down here, uh, but they need to test the interconnect, they can black box it and only deliver the wrapper. Uh, the, the third thing that we've, we've added and is what we're calling the flexible parallel port. Now, in test, the test world, just testing with a single bit, like you have, say, on 11.49.1 uh, TDI to TDO, that can get re really, really expensive if you're doing internal tests. And so we've added this flexible parallel port, which is essentially TSVs that are just for test. And these, these, these ports can go up, they can go down, uh, they can have pipelining in them, they can ha be, have nothing in them, they can even be a clock if you're bringing up to the next die or to the next die. You know, but what we're not defining, this is a die standard, we're not defining the stack. So if this guy only puts in four parallel ports, but this guy needs eight, there's a problem. So somebody still has to control the stack. Uh, and, and if it ever gets to the, the time when we're putting die on the shelf, then whoever delivers those die has to think about that. You know? um, and you can see down here, this is a boundary scan register, because this is the, uh, what we're calling the, the first die and a, a die wrapper register. So you can, ha you can share those. Uh, but you don't have to have, boundary scan registers has nothing to do with 1838. It's, it has to do with 1149.1. But we presume on many of the die, you will still have 1149.1 capabilities. All right, so um, that's it for me, I believe. Yeah, all right, thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Our next speaker is Brandon Wang from Cadence. Brandon Wang oversees the overall Cadence 3D IC and ultra low power solutions marketing and product development activities, as well as other enablement efforts on various advanced technologies with strategic partners. Prior to joining Cadence, Brandon spent over six years at ARM, managing the Interface IP group and later the Phi product line. Before that, Brandon was with Ubicom, a network processor startup that is now part of Qualcomm. Brandon holds six U.S. patents and has published at a number of IEEE conferences and in journal papers. Brandon also serves as a board director of CASPA, a nonprofit semiconductor organization. Brandon is a graduate in electrical and computer engineering from New Jersey Institute of Technology. He also holds an MBA from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. Brandon.
Thank you, Jerry. Yeah, so my talk is uh, we, I think from the previous two speakers, we know the challenges of how the integrated system, whether it's a SIP or 3DIC, uh, that we are facing. So I'm going to dive directly into a few solutions that have, you know, either in publication or we have tested the water. So let's look at the three, uh, the heterogeneous integration kind of uh, feel. Uh, um, you see the, there's a 2.5D silicon interposer, which have multiple dyes, logic dyes, memory dyes, different type of dyes sitting on top of a silicon interposer. Uh, and those are the TSV based, but TSV only in the silicon interposer. Then you have the true 3DIC that have TSVs actually implemented in each of the logic, uh, logic or memory die. Okay. Now, there are TSV-less integration, which is really um, the diagram on the, uh, let me sh try to show where is the. Okay. Yeah, so, so this one is face-to-face uh, -face, um, 3D integrations without TSV. It's really lower cost. And you still have a traditional wire bound to bring ultimately the BGA signal to the substrate. Uh, this is uh, the one that probably uh, the new one called um, Integrate Fan Out or Info. You know, those are the um, routing uh, that implement in a molding compound through a silicon scale RDL routing to connect two dyes. Uh, so there are no TSV involved, so it, it is still a, a lower cost and suitable for consumer application. Right, and of course, there's a future uh, monolithic 3D ICs. Uh, you probably went to a, a few uh, technical track sessions on this. So this is uh, maybe a three years from now, but these are really challenging. You'll be able to do clock routings from one die to another die and still balance the skill like we do in SOC. Uh, this is about uh, four years ago um, that um, Cadence proposed the so-called the co-optimization. You know, there's a word called co-optimization, co-design, you know, co-analysis. There's slightly different degree of integration here. Uh, so this one uh, takes the IEC database, whether either it's from a uh, Virtuoso or EDIs or Innoverse, and be able to communicate the IEC of uh, physical and electrical uh, information through a die abstract. And then you actually do the integrate uh, the optimization of the uh, bonding pad, uh, the the uh, the PISI through your regular package um, design platform. Uh, and, and these are a few pictures. The one one of the enhancements you did is that the now the package uh, design tool need to recognize a few of the IC layers, okay, in order to do it. So there's a database integration a partial data this database integration that allows that iteration to be happening. So we proposed that about four years ago. And let's look at, um, you know, um, this is two years ago. We look at, we have uh, the, the, the customer, requires, customer requirement is to have an exploration tool to look at how you plan your 3DIC. Okay, so uh, Orbit I.O. is the one that linking the SIP design, the silicon from analog, a digital and PCB together. Um, so this is really a uh, white whiteboard kind of drawing tools allows you to do a planning. But the good thing is that database get, gets saved uh, into the SIP so that you can actually doing plannings of 3D ICs without really knowing what process node you're gonna go for your IC. A and then once you go to the SIP, and that is a stage I'm gonna show a diagram later how you find out what will be the other component? What will be the electrical and mechanical uh, simulations between uh, the SIP database and here? So th really, this is a high-level drawing board. Maybe in the beginning of the product, the architect would be uh, planning through our Orbit I.O. So uh, this is another example of how the integrate fan out. I think uh, this is getting hot, this technology, right? So, but integrate fan out can be a wafer scale. That means the DRC check for those type of technology can go as low as the IC level, right? So you really need an IC tool to check massive um, DRC errors. But then again, you look at some of the shape are actually 
very package design alike. You know, teardrops, you know, arc. You know, it's not really a Manhattan structure that the IC guy get used to, right? The database need to be, uh, we call it vectorization. So you take certain shape, like uh, I give an example, a RAM pad you often see in the package design, and the tool automatically, internally, transparent to a to, to user, uh, to do vectorization. So you end up with a finer enough element that it can pass IC level of DRC check. And that is transparent to the users. So you can virtually design your fan out technology in your familiar package tool, right? Whether it's Allegro, Civ, or some, And then you plug in the vect vectorization, and then you can run your DRC in the Foundry Fab design rules. And that is where how we uh, link uh, uh, IC design rigid requirement to a, uh, a board level of design. Um, the reason is because the scale, you, if you look at the RDO routing for integrated fan out, those are really a few micron width. So these are the IC level scale. Uh, I also like to introduce for the designers. So um, there's always a question like, what platform is your cockpit? What platform is your basic platform you're going to do this so-called co-design, right? The conclusion is funny, can depend on which customer I visit and then which particular person in that company I'm talking to. In 3D, I see that it's owned by possibly by a package guy in a large company or by IC guys, and they will give you exactly opposite about what the requirement is, right? So um, what we end up doing is that, how about the, the integrated database that allows, um, it's not a code design, it's an integrated database into a certain level of integration so that the, the IC designers, the PCB designer, and the package designers all feel comfortable with, right? I pick one of the example they called a cross-fabric design environment, C, um, CFDE, that we released um, late last year, uh, is to look at how electrically and layout-wise, these are physically they connected together with um, different level of DRC uh, layout check. Uh, so this is an example of showing the centerpiece of the cross-fabric design environment. Uh, you, you see here is that you have a module build for certain trace the routing here. You have IC, and you have a, um, a, a, a package, and then the top level is actually a PCB board, okay, all in, in the same place. Uh, the, the key here is that this database has the resolution you need for each of the components. You know, uh, so when I when I put my probe highlight here, that gets highlighted. That's a PCB routing, right? When I put my um, e uh, curse here, I click it highlight the connectivity actually in the IC layout. It shows the parasitic model of the particular IC in the trosso. It shows the EAD. Probably people know electric aware design. They're showing there, and that's very familiar for the IC guys and these PCB guys and. I don't. I maybe have a picture showing the cross probing. Yes, so th this is a cross probing. I talk about as you know, you you um you you descend into each of them. You'll be able to see um the the, the you know the layout of each of uh, here. You can actually create a schematic and have the tool automatically lay out that for you in a PCB level. So th this is really uh, easy for the IC guys to look at the PCB and also for the PCB guys to electrically. Uh, truly integrate the IC database, not just in, in a high-level kind of planning. Uh, and this is even uh, funny, is that you can actually generate a system in a package, which is a package kind of traditionally Excel sheets package layout. You can generate the system in package layout directly from virtuoso schematic, right? So for high-speed signals, for SIRDIs, for IF designs, the guy's doing all the polish in the ICs, and he wants certain package to be designed in a certain way. Uh, and Excel sheets isn't, isn't do the cut, right? So that you can, this example, I actually draw this one in that schematic, and I click back to, so to say auto layout. And that's the layout to generate in and out of this. Um, uh, this is the final system PCB layout that generate out of uh, the schematic you're drawing. So if you join schematic like that, you don't have to worry about electronic connectivity because you create it 
with the native database with it's all connected, right? And of course, you do um, dif uh, design differential check for the ECL purpose. Anything you change, you come back and then you. Uh, and then it also shows in the, this level with the build library, it shows the build material of what component you're using. That component now expanded, not just a component of IC, but a component of IP also. And we have IP library also to build in the hype, uh, your heterogeneous hybrid integration model through this um, uh, the back end to frame uh, back end frame C cross cross fabric design. Okay, I moved the topic a little bit. So, 3D I C everybody knows um, it's not just about physical check. I show you how to do vectorization, how to do connectivity, how to make sure the DRC LVS works. But it's a lot of electrical. Uh, it particularly EM and IR drop gets involved uh, in a uh, chip and, and package code design. I, I won't say maybe not PCB, but chip and, uh, and package levels, IR drop and EM is always a, a challenge, right? This one shows you that what is so-called the code design, code simulation flow they are we are currently using. It's way better than Excel sheets already. I mean, the leading company already using this type of flow, right? So I'm taking, let's see, Voltus is happened to be a power analysis tool for the IC. So I'm taking that one, and I do have a, the MC, uh, MCP format to be able to dump into a security tool, which is a package analysis tool, electrical analysis tool. Uh, and you can run this iteration electronically uh, to get optimization, okay? A better one, is truly co-design co is that you actually have a single integrated uh, uh, cockpit and script-based run script, right? Because a lot of IC designers, they sometimes look at it, but during iteration, they don't want to look at this all the time. So this is a script-driven, so that it has a very um, strict discipline because the reason here is that now because it's integrated, you can use a single strip, you know, a script, you know, 10 lines of script to drive your design all the time. So you know, no matter which engineer run it, it should get the same result. And that's where uh, the GUI provide a, uh, another way is when it's all said and done, you can display that your, um, uh, your, your um, 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 EMIRs at one window while showing the, uh, uh, the package level of, uh, of the uh, EMIR showing here. So this is really for the uh, for the visualization, but the key here is you don't stop at the visualization because you can't use your eyeball to check your quality. The, the, the real technology behind that is you integrate in the database and can be run by a strictly controlled script base, uh, a, a script base, so that you bring your package design and hybrid code design to the same uh, rigid requirement as IC guys do, does. So this is a uh, Talk about the thermal. Uh, I put this is a part of the integrate uh, cockpit, but uh, but thermal is particularly uh, interesting to uh, to 3D IC or anything that's spatially very form factor very small. So your lack of you know physical contact to dissipate the heat, uh, and that is going to be uh, important in either in a large cloud server or in the IoT, right? So this is a voltage showing. So so this is where uh, the power, uh, the, the, te uh, the thermal engine takes individual blocks of your IC, assuming your IC is large, and multiple ICs, power consumption, from your power consumption analysis tool, and then do a layer-based, layer-based means each metal layer-based uh, temperature map. So you'll be able to close out your EM for your metal layer routed on your IC, on each IC. So. Uh, I, 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 rem I remember saying this method um, uh, a couple years ago, but back then we only have called die base. So you get a temperature map for each die that are stacking together or interpose uh, through interposer. Uh, so the new thing we added is now you can not only look at each die, but you can dissect each die at each layer of metal. So you can have a more finer EM um, uh, analysis for each of the uh, Ele electron migration analysis for each of the layer. So the key purpose is to further reduce the extra margin that you wasted when you are trading you know, single die as an as a object. And uh, we already achieved that trading different area of the silicon at a different temperature 
with the different EM rule, because the EM rule changed drastically versus temperature, particularly at the higher temperature, it kind of fell, you know, falling off the cliff. So we want to look at it and say, hey, if this red area is your DDR, you know, bus that consume a lot of area, then we want to have an EM enhanced on that area only instead of, uh, of doing that. And of course, the, the other thing is the IR drop. IR drop is, you know, impact the performance. It's not a reliability issue in terms of performance, but it, you can also yield your IR drop analysis based on the, the area. IR drop is going to be area-based IR drop analysis, and that further reduces the margin that you wasted for your IC design in your heterogeneous integration environment. Now, switch topic again. We have many tools cover different areas. So, uh, so this is the uh, new coming called the, the uh, 3D integration of silicon photonics. Uh, in the uh, data center and server market, this is the way to, uh, one of the way to dramatically increase the bandwidth between the memory die and, uh, and uh, your server chip, okay? Uh, and uh, by using the optical, uh, optical component, right? So we have, uh, so th the key here is, is silicon photonics. It's not the old uh, optical device that you actually do in the factory. So the guy who's doing this integration or doing the whole design is actually a silicon guy, right? So we create a silicon design friendly environment to integrate the silicon photonics inside uh, our virtual IC design environment. Um, and that including, you know, the, um, uh, the electrical to electrical, optical to electrical, optical, optical, LDS check, and extraction, electrical to electrical, optical, electrical, DRC check, and uh, uh, simulations with different PVT corners from the silicon side. And I maybe have another slide, I know. So uh, yeah, so this is too small to see, but what really happened here is that you will have a optical component-based PDK that plugging into your a existing uh, virtual design environment. So you implement your optical designs uh, with, um, yes, yeah, so I, I think the, the slideshow didn't come. So when this, when this overlap happened again, there's a, um, the product that we work with, the particular company, Luxsource, is doing that. So that's two, two or three years ago. A and I think that's, will be uh, uh, viable f to, the, uh, to the server and data center based of the uh, integration, whether it's 2.5D or 3D. So the last area I didn't touch is mechanical. I think that there are traditional PCB and packaging mechanical designs that are very mature. I think that there are interaction towards the electric side, but definitely not as intense as the IoT market, which definitely will have sensor and MEMPS in, uh, integrated right on top of the IC. Sometimes uh, it's right on top of IC through the um, TSV-alike technology, the connecting the processing signal across the, di across the die. And those are the real challenge. I think the real impact and the inaccuracy will really damage your end product, and we have to do it in a very cheaper way. So this is, uh, this is the platform called Simply, okay? The Simply platform provide a uh, mem uh, design with the uh, mixed signal design. Usually these integrate with the mixed signal first uh, before it touches the uh, pure digital controller. So this could be a 3D ICs. And then this is the platform how uh, this gets, um, uh, the, the, the mem design flow gets uh, uh, integrated or co-designed uh, with the regular mixed signal and, uh, and, uh, I and IC design. I may have another page to show that detail. Yes. So this is the MEMPS uh, subflows, okay? Yeah, talk about that. It's every time I go to a customer and say, we have a co-design, some people think, oh, you just want to sell more tools together, right? It's not. Actually, this example showing we actually work with, um, with um, ANSYS, you know, some sort of our competitor, to because they were leading in FEM, uh, of, uh, um, a multi-physics simulator, so we'll be able to uh, create a virtual-based mixed signal MEMS design environment and use uh, the multi-physics uh, FEM engine as part of the, uh, the virtual uh, GUI, okay? So I probably cannot go into the detail of how this is done, this little 
the detail, but you're welcome to ask any question. It's called the interlaced uh, interactions between a MEMS design and the mixed signal design. So that well, uh, that's another example is that you'll be able to use the uh, simply t uh, uh, plan for uh, the the, the te template uh, to generate. Um, uh, a, uh, a just like you doing the transistor, right? We all know how to parameterize a transistor layout, and that is an example that you param parameterize the, the 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 MEMP designs based on the MEMP module uh, out of a regular virtual layout tool. Okay, that uh, move to the uh, summary part. Um, so I think the era of system design through heterogeneous integration is here. It's finally here. So the long loop of so-called, uh, yeah, you still can do it by many different format of iteration is not good enough when it comes to a heterogeneous integrated system. Uh, and we need a better power and, 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 and a, a, a better performance and a cost and time to market in the heterogeneous integration. Uh, we do think the, 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 the IoT and the wearables will drive the TSB less 3D, which is really lower cost, info alike, to be popular in, in a consumer kind of product. Um, and, uh, and also the member and sensor co-design, together with the IC PCB co uh, package co-design, is really a, uh, a, a must uh, for a smaller form factor designs in that particular application domain. Now, cloud, data center, high performance computing, uh, for deep learning is another area, and that is the area that we think the TSV-based heterogeneous integration will be the main factors. Stuff like silicon photonics integration in your regular IC design will be a good addition um, to that. Now, uh, I think that's a small list of the feature that I just talked. So we have a system level planning tool for heterogeneous integration, have the database reserved to move to the co-design, and analysis your IC in the context of your PCB and package system. And then we do co-design optimization in the multi-die multi system in the package. Um, and we also do the cross DB, means that there are different DB get partially integrated to create a physical verifications and analysis. Um, Layer-based thermal, aware EMIR, very important for, for small form factors and mechanical design integration. Thank you. Thank you, Br thank you, Brandon, and uh, thanks to all our panelists. Uh, these were very interesting presentations. We saw a number of different perspectives. Um, at this point, um, we can ask the panelists questions if anyone in the audience has any questions uh, for them. If not, um, I have some questions. <laughs> so uh, clearly, these 3D devices and 2.5D and devices are very complex. They're complex for many different dimensions. I'm curious to understand from a functional perspective how these are, how you see these being simulated functionally. Is the entire stack of multiple devices all simulated at one time? Or is it a divide and conquer approach where you simulate each one individually and then through some scripts or something, uh, assume that they're all going to work together when you put them together? Um, would the panelists, would someone like to comment on that? Do you want to? I can. I'll comment on, on that a little bit. I, I think you just have to look at uh, the 2D world and say, oh, well, we do have to simulate together everything eventually. And even in the uh, board world, you eventually have to simulate everything together. And you're going to have to do the th same thing in the, in the 3D stack die world. And But there's problems, bigger problems, because if, if your board doesn't work, you can take a chip off and throw it away. If your 3D stack doesn't work, you're taking a lot of die away and, and, and throwing it away. Um, and there's more issues, like I touched on thermal a little bit. And because you thin those dyes so much, there's no way for the heat to dissipate through the substrate. It's further away from the heat sink. And you have to take that into account. Somehow, you have to know what dies on top of you, how it's going to be running, to understand how they're going to interact together. 
so there's it, there's bigger issues than what we've what, what we've hit before. So uh, that's a very interesting answer, and, and leads to a related question that I have is when you're doing power analysis. I mean, clearly, power is an issue for all of us these days, but especially in a stack device, or even if it's not stacked, you know. Uh, a, a SIP or a two and a half D device. You've got multiple devices in close proximity. Um, you're often driving these devices pretty hard. When you do power analysis or thermal analysis, again, are you doing those individually and then taking the individual results and combining them for a, an entire system view? Or are you somehow doing power analysis and thermal analysis of the entire package I'm sorry, not package, but the entire system at once. Yeah, I can add on this a little bit. So um, five, well, six years ago, so we did a test chip with uh, Ericsson back in Europe, right? Uh, it's for mobile. It's a 3D with the wide I.O. when the wide I.O. is still in the infancy. So one of the things we find out is that the traditional thermal analysis for a package is what we call an equilibrium thermal check is make sure that in certain mode of the application, whether it's video rendering or regular phone call, you look at the temperature profile to say, do I have a good enough package for thermal dissipation? Now, when you're in 3D, what really happens is you not only need to do a Caribbean thermal analysis, you also need to do a so-called transient thermal analysis. So you need to look at it, say, how many seconds it takes for the other die to be in to be thermally impacted by the dye beneath it, right? The reason I say that is because dye to dye distance in 3D is about two to 300 micron, and the dye itself is 10 millimeter wide. So the vertical scale is way smaller than the horizontal, a and uh, the heat dissipation, diffusion from one dye to another is instant. The particular chip we had is 150 of the time, one fiftieth of the time, compared with the LPDDR4, which is now very popular in your cell phone, right? Uh, and part of the reason why dial didn't really go into into cell phone is because of the uh, the thermal uh, diffusion out of the DDR block, which is very very high uh, thermal dissipation, impacts the sensor right on top of the memory die, and it caused the memory die dead lock. And that is the amount of time it takes to do that tra uh, transition is so fast that you actually have a thermal two requirement. One, you, you have the thermal tool to actually do transient thermal analysis, not equilibrium, not mode-based. The second one is that you actually need to do the thermal analysis concurrently. So you have a, let's say you have a digital eye be, uh, below the, the, the your memory die, you actually have to have your VCD based of, a, um, of the power analysis a, a in your um, um, uh, digital die concurrently with the thermal engine that running uh, both of the die together. So yeah. that means you're effectively doing a functional simulation of all of this to get the VCD for the for all the die in this in this uh, in the system, right? That's right. Yeah. Does that sound okay there? Yeah. So I, I think today it's it's really possible to go through and put the whole system assembly together. I think the conundrum or the issue that the market's facing is time. The time to get to an answer is just too long. Like I said, with case studies that we've done, they typically take you know days to weeks to just get the full system uh, assembly put together, to do the meshing, to do the, uh, the analysis and crunching, and then make a decision, right? And this is, I think, where we're trying to look at you know, more unique algorithms to go through and simplify the data model now that we can go through and put a full system together from the design side is how do we simplify specific elements, you know, let's say for example, you know, micro bumps or C4 bumps across a stack system. You know, how do we simplify those models where it doesn't create too many variances from the accuracy point of view and really reduces that, you know, simulation time and the meshing time that takes place. So I think that's where I think the real challenge sits is time. I think the tools are out there to go through and build that system today. So uh, I think that's a, a very interesting comment. The, uh, at least I didn't hear too much talk about time until now. With the complexity, certainly costs go up, efforts go up, uh, more effects come into play, but clearly time is an issue, getting to market, and of course there's cost associated with time. Well, I'd just like to add one more thing because it may not be solvable unless we do something different. Right, so things that I hear about are water cooling the dye up on top, or using 
material with thermal characteristics that will melt and cool the dye, and then after it stops running for a while, it, it'll it'll go back. And and now we have to take that into account with the tools. How how is that going to be handled? Yeah, I think from my perspective, we're going to need innovations in a number of areas. Um, certainly, the things that all of you have talked about today are innovations in a variety of areas, and we're going to need a lot more of that. Questions from anyone else? Well, at this point, uh, I'd like to give our panelists a hearty round of applause for a, a very interesting and detailed and stimulating discussion. Thank you very much. <laughs>